Okay, I think we can begin now. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us in our first first of three virtual classroom webinars. We're so excited to bring, to bring our programming to the comfort of your own homes today. My name is Lucy and I'm the Executive Director of HackerGal. Can you see me? Sorry. Can you? Perfect. Am I good to go? Yeah, we can see you now. It was awesome. just black before. Looks awesome. Awesome. For those of you who may not know, HackerGal is a charitable organization that inspires girls across Canada to explore the endless possibilities in code. We partner with teachers and school boards to bring coding education to their classrooms and now today in the comfort of your own homes. Technology is the fastest growing industry across North America. The Canadian tech industry grows 35% year after year. And and over three over 30 years, it has not grown since. So in 1987, women represent 20% of the STEM force, and today they still only represent 23% of the STEM for, workforce. And according to a McKinsey report, only 13% of girls will consider a job in tech. How is this so when how is this so when tech is really dope? I worked in tech for my entire career, which not which doesn't seem that long, but it's over 10 years of industry experience. I started my career working at a local tech startup and made my way to Toronto to work at a local venture capital firm investing in the latest technologies. It was so inspiring to see entrepreneurs use tech to solve everyday problems and problems at a global scale. But what I didn't see was many people that looked like me and more importantly, women. That's what inspired me to create HackerGal and that's why we're here today in hopes to inspire a new wave of female coders and bring equity to the landscape. So I'm going to pass it to Kamiko to kick things off for us. Hi everyone, I'm Kamiko. I'm so excited to see so many of you here. Um, we were looking at the list of attendees last night. I saw so many familiar faces. This is new for us. Hacker Gal is used to going to do workshops at schools and meeting teachers and students in person, along with um, virtual webinars, but this is a, a whole new world. So we're so excited to have your support virtually. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the Director of Education at HackerGal. That means I work with students and teachers all over Canada to bring coding education into schools and to show students like yourselves how to build and create with code. So today's theme is all about creativity and code. We planned this webinar to show you that coding is much more creative than you think. Even if you're not going to be a full-time developer or programmer, understanding what code is will help you to think critically and to understand the world that we live in. I think now more than ever, we're all noticing how technology is everywhere and computers are so important. So I think it's so important to, that you're here with us today and you're taking that first step to, to learn something new. So we want to show you that careers in technology are very diverse and that tech jobs involve a lot more than just sitting in front of a screen. The woman who you will hear from today each led their own unique journeys getting into tech and they're so excited to share that journey with you. We're going to kick off with an interactive poll because we'd love to know where you're joining us from today. So on your screen, Lucy is going to uh, show you there's two questions. So the first question is about what part of Canada are you joining us from? Northern Canada, Western Canada, Eastern Canada, Central Canada, or maybe we even have a few folks outside of Canada. So please fill that in. And if you're wondering which your province is, there's a little bit of uh, hints there. And then the second question is a mood barometer. On a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? One would be kind of sluggish, waking up slowly, and five is like, I'm here, I'm ready to go. I am wide awake, I've had coffee. So choose which one uh, represents you, and then we will show the results in about 20 seconds. And imagine there's some nice elevator music playing in the background here. For those of you that are done voting, you can also have a look at the webinar agenda. So if you're wondering who will be speaking when, and, and if you wanna Google some of the amazing women that, that you see on this list, um, we've got a really packed agenda with exciting speakers. Also, you may have already noticed that the chat and video are turned off for attendees. That is for security purposes. So just keep in mind, you won't be able to chat. Um, 
up where we do have the Q&A feature. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q and an A and a little dialog box and that icon uh, allows you to submit a question that can be viewed by the panelists only. So if there's someone speaking and you have a burning question that you'd like to ask her, you can use the Q&A feature um, to submit a question. And at the end, uh, time permitting, we'll try and get through one or two questions per speaker. Um, yeah, let's see, how are we doing? Okay, cool. <laughs> so you can see the results there. We have a lot from Central Canada, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and people are mostly at a four. Okay, and I'm glad to see no one's at a one. A two, and you know, 10 weeks into quarantine, our moods fluctuate, but hopefully we'll get all of you twos and threes up to a four and five by the end of this session. Um, yeah, that's great. The last thing I'm gonna say is I'd like to pass the mic back to Lucy and she's gonna introduce our first speaker. So thank you so much. And I will go off video and on mute. Thank you so much, Kimiko. So without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce our first keynote speaker, Tiff. The Tiffany Jansen. I met Tiff when HackerGal first moved to the DMZ, which is a local technology incubator here in Toronto. I immediately noticed that she was the only female developer on her team, on her code development team, and was curious to know her story. Tiff is a software developer at IBM today. Outside of her work, she spends her time encouraging others to get into STEM fields through her company, Tiffin, and also hanging out with her dog, Harry. I'd like to pass the floor to Tiff now. Hi hey everyone, thanks for the introduction Lucy. I'm very excited to talk to you all today really about my journey into technology. As Lucy mentioned, I am currently a software developer at IBM. However, I definitely have not always been in the tech industry and for a long time I really didn't even know it was an industry that I could even get into or, or would consider. So I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, my background with you and how I unconventionally navigated into the tech, tech industry. Uh, first of all, I grew up in Saskatchewan in a very small town and during my high school years, I don't even think there was a computer science related course or even, I don't even remember if there was a computer lab. It was a very small town and, and to me, I throughout my time in high school, I knew I wanted to do something that was creative, that was ever-changing and evolving, and, and not being exposed to the tech industry at all, I thought, okay, well, this must mean fashion. So after I graduated from high school, I ended up going to Vancouver, where I ended up studying fashion merchandising. And I really thought that was my career path, the road I was going to go down. And after I graduated from fashion merchandising, I had an opportunity to go overseas. And from someone coming from a small town in Saskatchewan, I was like, this is amazing. Uh, I, my opportunity to go overseas was to do some modeling there. So I still didn't really know where this would take me or how this would evolve, but I thought, why not give it a try? So I moved to Hong Kong when I was 19 and, and had a wonderful time exploring and traveling and, and meeting a lot of people, but I felt like something was really missing. There was an aspect that was really missing, which was continuing my education, continuing to learn and grow. So once again, I decided to pack up my bags and continue my education by moving to Toronto. In Toronto, I applied and was accepted to uh, Ryerson University, where I studied graphic communication management. And this really had a strong focus on the graphic design side of things. And even at this point, I still didn't know really much about coding. It was in my fourth year though that it was required to take a very basic coding course, but I instantly fell in love with it, with the problem solving side of things mixed with the creativity side of things and really being able to ideally build anything that, that came to mind. And that was so exciting for me. However, just finishing graduating university, I really didn't want to go back to school for another four years. So I decided to go to a coding bootcamp. My coding bootcamp was a very, very intense but positive experience and I knew at the end of it I would either love coding or, or hate it and I came out absolutely loving it even more. After I graduated from that, it was a, quite an easy transition to, to find my first job as tech is such a booming industry and in-demand uh, industry and same with coding being so in-demand. And, and now I've been in the tech industry for, I guess it would be three years now, and currently, as I mentioned, working at IBM. 
a lot of questions I get around my job include, well, is it boring? Is it, do you do the same thing every day? Do you just look at a computer? And I can answer with complete positivity that is false. Every day I get to use so much creativity by solving different problems, finding different solutions. With coding, there really isn't, um, there really isn't one solution fits all. So you really have to be very creative in finding different ways to solve different uh, problems, which I think is very exciting because every day looks so different. The last thing I want to leave you with is a lot of you, I'm sure, are considering what industry to get into. There are so many amazing industries out there, but one thing that is certain is tech touches all of them. So one thing with coding I think is really exciting is say you are interested in fashion or fitness, you can use these skills with coding to go into multiple, any industry because it's so in demand. Go in that industry for a while and then maybe you want to try another industry. They're really transferable when you, when you have coding skills. I'm going to open it up to any Q&A you have now. Uh, thank you for, for listening to my story. Thanks, Tiff. That was so inspiring to hear how you're, you went from like a, a very non-traditional journey to code. And I know many of us on the line here may be um, considering post-secondary degrees and whatnot, but it's comforting to know that um, you can pivot along your journey and get into tech whenever along the way. So that's super cool. I know we have one question from Isla, who is a HackerGal ambassador. I will pass it over to her and then we could see if we have some time to take Q&A. All right. Hi. Um, my name is Isla Farnood, and that was a really, really great keynote speech. Um, I think especially I really love hearing um, stories from women who come from a background which might not exactly be tech, but still manage to like get into the industry and actually become like a super boss woman. Mm -hmm. um, so my question, like looking at the modeling industry, like I feel like that's a really female dominated one. Um, like. I think I've even heard that like um, the pay gap there is like where women are paid more than men. So I was wondering is like going from an industry like that, which is like there's so many women um, in that industry and like they're often like sought after more than like male models um, into an industry like tech where like the pay gap is like completely flipped around. Men are paid more than women. Um, there's like gender like discrimination but um yeah like what was that experience like for you that's isla that's thanks for your question isla that was an amazing question um and and very insightful i've never actually really thought of it to that degree of a 180 but it, it really was for me um one of the things to be completely candid when i when i first started into my journey i i felt quite alone um because i i didn't have any friends that were in the tech industry at all um so it felt a little bit overwhelming, but one thing that really helped me and I always suggest to anyone is to find a mentor. And I know in the second question I get asked a lot is, well, how do you do that? And I can tell you this from my experience anyways, it's, it's, it's intimidating at first, but I, I, I found a girl on LinkedIn and she was in technology and she had a really interesting career path. And I, I just reached out to her because the worst that happens is they say they're too busy, right? So I thought, why not give it a try? And, and I, I can tell you this, most 99% of the time, people will be very responsive and, and be almost flattered that you want to take them out for coffee. So I, I reached out to her and, and I grabbed coffee with her. And, and just by developing that relationship, it really helped having that. And she knew, you know, X number of other women in tech that she introduced me to. And, and I realized that because it is, because women are, there isn't as many women as men in tech. Um, from my experience, the women are in tech. Um, it's a really tight knit community in a positive way. Um, every time I told another individual I was getting into the industry, they were so exciting and telling me about this, you know, book club or something else that I could join. And it made me feel very positive. So I guess to answer your question, reach out to reaching out to a mentor or someone to kind of help um, along the way was essential. Um, and then, yeah, trying to find your, your community within, within tech really, really helps. You don't have to go through it alone and realize that the, your emotions and the things that you're going through, you're not alone in it. And, and I mean, that's why I love what HackerGal is doing too, to encourage others to, to get into the industry. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.
Um, we will take one question on the Q&A, and I know we're, we're just running a little bit behind on time, so I want, I'll speed it up, but to feel free to answer the questions in the Q&A okay. if you're still. Um, one question is, what do you do at IBM? That's a great question. Um, so as a software developer at IBM, I work on the technical consulting side of things. So what that means is um, there's kind of two, two big facets. One would be working on pro like IBM actual products and the other on the consulting thing is um, working with clients. So on the consulting side of things, I'm building products for um, different industries that IBM works with, which I really like because it means that currently say I'm working with an airline company and then maybe in six more months, I'll be working with a health and fitness company or with a sports company. So I like how I can touch different industries with my job. Um, at IBM as a software developer, maybe it might be surprising to some of you, but I don't spend most of my day coding. I mean, some days more than others, but a lot of it is working in teams, coming up with different solutions to problems. Um, scoping out different work and uh, it's very, very collaborative. Um, obviously some of it is coding, which I love, but it's not just sitting at a computer uh, nine to five um, um, coding. It's a lot of collaboration. So cool. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to pass it. Thank you so much, Tip. Yeah. I'm going to pass it on to Kamiko now. Hi, I hope you can see me now. Um, thank you so much, Tiffany. And thank you, Isla. And thank you to the audience for asking some questions. I am so excited to uh, introduce our next speaker. You can see her beautiful photo and job title there. Melissa is the Director of Marketing at Snowman. For those of you that haven't heard of Snowman before, it's a software studio based in Toronto, Ontario. That's where I am right now, um, with the mission to build apps that people can enjoy every day. So whether that's to stay more organized, to be productive, or to have fun, they build some really cool stuff. Melissa has a diverse background in marketing, public relations, and product development, and she's responsible for sharing Snowman games with the world. Previously, Melissa worked in a marketing and PR at startups, both locally and she worked internationally, and as a product designer as a little tiny company you might have heard of called Walt Disney. Outside of the office, you'll find Melissa dreaming up the next best ice cream flavor and trying the perfect recipe. So I will pass the uh, stage over to you, Melissa, and um, we're so looking forward to hearing from you. And again, I'll pop on at the end and see if there's any uh, Q&A questions. Thank you so much, Kamiko. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, my name is Melissa. Like Kamiko said, I'm the Director of Marketing at Snowman. And I'm really pumped to talk to you about what it's, work, what it's like working like at a video game studio here in Toronto and how I ended up in an industry with actually almost no tech background, kind of like Tiff. So first I'll tell you a little bit about Snowman. Um, we're an indie game studio here. We make premium artful video games that you can play on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. And we really love to think of our games as something for everybody. So they're not just for gamers or anything like that. They're really all centered around artful experiences and are super easy to learn. You may have even played some of them. Um, the most popular ones that you may have heard of would be Alto's Adventure or Alto's Odyssey. Um, so anyway, my job as the Director of Marketing is really focused on telling people about the games that we're making. It may sound really simple, but you can't just make a really awesome game or product. You have to remember to tell people about it so that they can find it. Uh, for me, this can be anything from thinking up ways to promote the games or how to connect our players to the games in interesting ways or pitch stories to journalists so that they write about our games in the news. Before marketing, I worked as a designer. So I also love to be involved in some of the elements of art development wherever I can and whenever my team lets me weigh in. And that kind of takes me to my personal history. So I went to university here in Toronto for communication studies, but I honestly had no idea what I was gonna do after school. I just knew that I wanted to do something creative and I went for a pretty broad degree. Every year, it's kind of cool because every year actually there are new programs being invented and it all happens to accommodate whatever's going on in the world. Like for example, when I was in university, you couldn't study anything social media related, but now you can get a whole degree in it. So when I was actually in school, I thought the tech industry was just computer science and engineering. So basically people who are good at math, science, physics, basically all of the things that I was weakest at. 
Um, my heart was always in the creative subjects like art or writing, drama, English, that kind of stuff. So I always wanted to do something creative and I wrote off tech thinking, eh, it's not for me. Um, little did I know, however, <laughs> I had no clue that tech was such a creative industry. So after university, I ended up moving to Germany. Um, very similar story to Tiff, I guess. Um, and I lived there for six years. I first got a job working at a fashion startup in marketing, and then I ended up becoming super lucky to find a job at the Walt Disney Company. There I worked for about five years as a product designer, and I developed baby and toddler products, which was really fun. Um, it was a super way that I could blend all of my passion for creativity with marketing, because once I worked on designing the products, I was able to collaborate with my team and other departments to strategize on how we wanted to package them, think about which stores they might want to be sold in, and who would even be buying them at the end of the day. My time there was really awesome. I could talk forever about Disney, but all I'll say is that after five years, I had heard let it go one too many times and I needed something new. So when I moved back to Toronto, I started working at a catering tech startup. And this is when I was really first introduced to the world of tech at a job. So I learned all about engineering and coding, technical product design, what goes into making a tech product, a million new words, and yeah, so many things. Um, it's really where I started to learn that tech jobs really require creativity. It was just a different type of creativity than I was used to. So similar to what Tiff was saying, Tech is about solving problems creatively. And I realized this is exactly what I do. It's just with a different set of problems. So marketing problems are all about communication and figuring out how to connect customers with products so that they realize that they want to buy them. Where in tech, the problems can be so much different. Like once at Snowman, one of our developers and one of our animators spent an entire week figuring out how to make a cheetah stretch perfectly realistically. So. It's really cool stuff. Um, and after working in the catering tech company, I realized that I love food, but my heart just wasn't in it. So I wanted to find that spark again that I had at Disney where I could really blend all of the things that I loved, which were like design, creativity, communication, but I still really wanted to be surrounded by tech and learn more about it. And that's when I got to Snowman. At Snowman, I am really lucky. I have all of this in spades. And this is pretty much because we make everything collaboratively. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we make a video game. And if you have any questions after, you can definitely ask. Um, the first thing we do is we jam. This is another cool tech term that I learned. <laughs> and it's basically when you all sit in a room and you talk about your ideas. You brainstorm on scraps of paper and whiteboards and you talk in endless circles sometimes about what you think would be fun. And we often play tons of games, like video games, board games, anything. Um, once we have an idea, our game designers figure out how the game's actually gonna work. So what the goals are gonna be, how you progress, you win, you lose, all of that stuff. Then they work together with our programmers to start building the game, AKA writing the code. And then our art team, which are artists, animators, and sound designers, start imagining what this whole world looks and sounds like. They send all of their work to the developers who then program it into the game. Our producers are then the product managers who make sure all of these people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, communicating well, meeting deadlines, and working together. The whole thing, honestly, from start to finish is a huge collaboration. So everyone really works together every single day. Um, everyone individually is really important, but we all need each other to get our work done, even for me. So I have to know all about how the games are made, what new technology we might be using to develop them, and why that would be interesting for the media. For example, I'm working with some colleagues right now on a story with a major news publication about how one of our games was made. And we're working with the company that actually made the software we use to build it to do so. So it's a really big piece that will bring a lot of attention to our game. But to have even had this idea, I had to know that that was a thing, that this technology exists and why that might be interesting for consumers to read about or people in the games industry and all of that. And it's been a big effort. Um, a lot of the people on our team have worked together on this. And not only do you need to understand how marketing works, but I've also realized that you have to speak the language of tech, as I call it, to be able to figure out you know, how to connect all of these pieces together. And speaking of our team, um, I have a fun fact for you. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that I'm one of four women at Snowman. 
So our team is only 12 people. So that's actually a whole third of our company, which is pretty good compared to some of the stats that we heard earlier on the webinar, but we still really need more women and girls in tech. Um, they have to be you know, smart, passionate, creative. It doesn't matter that they're women, but we really want to have a well-rounded team. And unfortunately, though, we're always really looking hard to find amazing female tech talent. It's kind of hard. I mean, when we get applications, they're usually from men. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really just want to reiterate that um, it would be amazing to see more women who are passionate about things like art, design, coding, physics, problem solving, literally fun <laughs> to think about a career in tech and definitely in the games industry because women can absolutely have any job in tech that they want. Um, and I don't know how many of you know what you want to be when you grow up. Um, normally I ask people to raise their hands when I do a whole thing, but since you're all at home and I can't see you, I just want to tell you that um, for me, the best way to figure out what to do when you want to, when you grow up is to figure out what's actually out there because the world changes really fast. Um, look at us on this call. Nobody could have anticipated something like you not being able to go to school for a couple of months, but it happened. So now that you're home, I'm sure you're doing all kinds of things to keep busy in addition to your online learning. Um, and it really is a great time to discover more about the world and take time to learn something new. So it could be a cool time to even ask your parents to help you figure something out that you didn't know before. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to help and maybe even learn something themselves because it could really just spark something cool and give you ideas about what you might want to do when you grow up. And um, before I go, one more thing, I just want to say that um, it would be great if I could go back in time and reconsider that tech is a creative industry. I would have loved to know what kind of career I might have had, but um, if I could just share one thing with you, it's that it's best to be open-minded about these things because you just really never know until you try. Um, if you be yourself, you'll definitely find your place in the world. And in 2020, it's most likely going to lead back to tech. And by the time you guys are all finished school and ready to look for a job, it's going to be even more so. My journey to tech came through my passion for creative thinking and communication but um, you never know what's going to guide you there. You just have to be open to it. So even if you never, you know, touch the code or learn how to program at all, even just knowing a little bit about how the whole thing works and be able to kind of speak the language of tech, um, it'll really let you imagine what's possible with code and what you can do in the world today. Um, that's all the time I have. It was so great to chat with everybody. I hope that you enjoyed my story and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Melissa. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. If, if we were, were willing to, to ask, there's some really great questions. So if you're willing to, we'd love to ask you a couple of them. Yeah, we really, sure. I think the audience was inspired by what you say. I'll ask a couple and we'll just kind of be conscious of time. Um, the first question is, how does your studio think about females as users of video games? So when Ooh. you're building them? This is such a good question. Um, I actually never really played video games before I started at Snowman. So whenever we want to know um, what like the typical person who never plays games would think of something, I usually end up testing mm -hmm. it. Um, I think that for us, we really focus on finding projects that we are passionate about as a diverse team. And because we're one third women, it's just inevitable that um, we're going to make something that we hope is applicable to everybody. Um, our style of game is also really not something that tends to be more male dominant. For example, like a lot of the more violent games tend to be more so played by men. That's just kind of the way it is. Um, and we really veer in the opposite direction. But something that we always think about is who is playing our game, whether it's a man, a woman. We have a lot of kids who play our games. We have a lot of elderly people who play our games. Um, so for us, it's really thinking about what kind of person plays the game. And we really hope that, you know, we end up with an even balance of men and women or more women. Amazing. <laughs> Maybe we have some, I'm sure there's some, some, some kids on the line that would love to be video game testers. If you're ever looking, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and then one more question was just, some people think being involved in tech is an isolating career. Um, is there teamwork and collaboration in your day-to-day -day work? Yes. In a hundred million percent. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> um, I would say that like, you know, when you picture tech or programmers, um, you picture somebody like wearing these headphones at their desk every day, like, um, and yes, I have these, but 
<laughs> that's just for home office because my husband's noisy. Um, I have mine too. <laughs> nice. Um, but honestly, no, that's not what happens. Um, it's such a collaborative environment. Usually, most of the time, if you walk by the uh, corner of our office where all of our developers sit, they're standing and um, passionately discussing something, leaning over maybe one person's computer, talking all together. It's very rare that you see somebody on their own plugging in code. It really just comes down to the actual execution of an idea. And creating that idea is a team effort. It always is. It's just whoever gets assigned the job to, okay, like now put that in the game. Then we're going to go off, type it out, put it into the game, come back, and then we talk it through. Actually, we play it through. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. And the last question was just about where we can find your games. And we'll be sending an email to attendees after this. So Melissa will be including that information there as well. So thank you so much, Melissa. It was a pleasure to hear from you. Um, I know we'll be collaborating in the future. And we really appreciate you jumping online today. Thank you. Bye-bye. I, okay, so I'll stay on camera. I'm going to introduce our uh, next and last segment of the day. I can't believe how quickly it's gone. This is a fireside chat between Guadalupe Cohen Alonso and Jeanette Bag. These um, two lovely role models are here to speak to you and have a casual fireside chat, which kind of means like a, a conversation. There's no actual fire, but they're going to talk um, to each other. I would like to introduce both of them separately. So Guadalupe was born in Argentina and she moved to Canada at an early age, focusing on science and math in her schooling. After spending two years studying mathematics at the University of Waterloo, she took an unexpected turn and began a career in design. She currently works as a UX designer strategist at CIBC Digital, while also studying environmental design at OCAD University. She is passionate about the intersection between math, science, and art, and is happiest working in a space where tech meets design. She will be interviewed by Jeanette Bay. She is a grade 11 student, student currently at Notre Dame High School. She is part of a family of six and has a twin sister who you might see in the background at some point during this interview. Um, during her free time, she likes to binge watch some of her favorite shows on Netflix, read books, tutor her younger siblings, and practice learning Mandarin. After going through a variety of workshops and programs, she was exposed to the world of tech and instantly fell in love with it and its potential to shape a more bright and prosperous future. I will pass the, the stage over to the two of you. If you unmute your microphones and start your videos, I'll let you know if I can see everything clearly. Guadalupe, All I got right. you there, perfect. And I can hear Jeanette, perfect. And Guadalupe, can you just test to make sure I can hear you? Hi, everyone. Perfect, okay, I'm gonna go behind the scenes and... All right, so thank you for the introduction. So let's first start by you introducing yourself. Let's get to know you better. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I think Kamiko probably went through most of it, but just to recap, I grew up in Newfoundland for most of my life after moving from Argentina, so that's a very small town, and I focused on science and maths in my schooling there, so I was a math lead, I did science fair, all those kinds of things, and then I moved to Ontario to study at the University of Waterloo, but I ended up switching about two years in to a design career, so now I work at CIBC in Toronto. And I just recently, this year, just finished my first year of studying while working. So I'm also studying environmental design at OCAD University. That's kind of, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. So um, what would you say a day in the life looks like for a UX designer? So a day in the life of a UX designer, I get this question a lot because as I work in tech, people assume that I'm the one who's coding most of the time. But design really takes on three stages for me. There's the early stage, which is a lot of research and discovery. So that means talking to users, doing market research, really understanding different problems and gaps that we can fill as UX designers. And that also means working with tech partners a lot to understand feasibility. So we have a lot of old systems as a bank. So we need to think about how we're going to problem solve and what ways we're going to be able to build what we want to build and what's not doable and how we can work around that. So once the design process actually starts after that kind of discovery phase, we go into a lot of design thinking workshops, if you're familiar with those. So that includes journey mapping, persona workshops, different ways of collaborating with other people and really understanding and empathizing with the users. Um, so that can be whiteboarding sessions, et cetera. And we'll do a lot of wireframing at that stage. And that can also mean many rounds of testing. So we'll actually put our designs in early stages in front of users and see what they think. 
And then once it's kind of gotten to that point and we've created not just a design that's ready for now, but also a strategy of how we can get it to where we want it to be in say three years. So a list of features, for example, once we're at that stage, we'll work with actual developers to actually build the design. So I'll work next to them sometimes and just actually talk to them about, okay, what are we trying to do? And if they encounter any problems, I'll be there to answer their questions. And I'll usually also hand off to another designer to kind of do the final touches with them. Mm, so it includes like a lot of testing in the process. Yeah, it's, I would say if I were to say it in like three words, it's probably teamwork, collaboration, and testing. It's definitely a lot of testing. <laughs> All right, so um, what was your first real world experience in tech that made you realize that this is what I want to do? So I think one of the most interesting things and why I love Hacker Gals and everything that this is doing um, is that I didn't really see tech, as some of the other ladies said, I didn't really see tech as an option. Um, growing up in Newfoundland, it's not a big tech industry at all. So it didn't really seem like a career choice. And the only, um, as per one of the questions that was asked earlier, the only kind of vision I had in my head of it was sitting at a desk alone. Um, so I didn't really have an experience that told me I want to do tech. I had a brief stint of a workshop with social innovation where it talked about using tech to solve big problems in the world. And I think that really kind of sparks the interest, but it was more of a a landing in the role really and just getting to actually experience the tech industry and see what that was like that just eventually clicked um if that answers your question yeah all right so now up to advice so what advice would you give girls who are interested in pursuing careers in tech in the future and if you could give your younger self advice what would it be i think if i were to give advice it would be to try things out um, I think sometimes it's funny because we think we have to know what we want to do, but I think it's so much easier to figure out what you don't want to do and slowly get to where what you do want to do. So as much as you might think you might look at a role and think that it's not quite for you or you don't you're not really sure about it. I would suggest that you try it out as much as you can um, because it might have aspects that you don't realize you enjoy or you might just not have an idea of what you really want to do or what that career is really made up of. So try as much as you can and you can always say, okay, this wasn't for me, but I kind of really liked this one little thing and I'll go in that direction. Um, Cause I think that's what I ended up doing in the end. And that's kind of how I ended up somewhere that I really enjoy. Yeah. So um, now if you, like, if you had a negative experience ever in your workplace, um, how did you deal with it and how did you actually overcome it? So I think as I think Tiff mentioned a lot of this, but as a woman in tech, it's always going to be hard, I think, because we're still a minority for the most part. And I think for the one of the things that I come across every once in a while is trouble being taken seriously. So you might be, especially as a young woman in tech, you might be leading a group um, and you're not always seen as the expert in something, or it might be a bit hard to kind of get everyone to take you seriously. But I think Tiff said it perfectly. It's all about the support system. So if you're surrounded by people who will stand up for you in those situations, who will empower you, who believe in you, then it's easier to navigate that, right? Because you have the support of something behind you to be able to say, okay, I can do this. And you can kind of navigate them to the best of your ability with that support system. Mm -hmm. So like how many females are in your um, development team at the right now? So actually female developers, there's barely any. I think I can think of about two with the teams that I work with. Uh, designers, it's much more common. Yeah, but developing and overall tech, I mean, overall at CIBC, I think it would still be a minority. There's a lot of women in CIBC Digital, which is the specific branch that I work in, but I think there's definitely more on the design side than there is on the development side. Um, so I'm always happy when I see another woman in tech because I just kind of like get really excited about working with a female developer. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm um, looking back, what's one thing you would have done differently? It can be personal, personally related or career related. I, okay, this is going to sound a bit cheesy, but I actually hate saying that I would have done anything differently. Um, I don't really believe in thinking that way, I guess. So I like thinking about, you know, so everything that happened has led me to where I am and I can look back on that and learn from it for the future. Um, but those mistakes are what end up taking you to where you need to be. And I truly, truly believe that. So I think if anything, I would have just been nicer to myself about taking different paths and making mistakes and being okay with saying, 
this didn't work. I'm going to try something else. So I think that's kind of my yeah. way around that answer. Yeah, and I tr totally believe that life is mainly about not perfectionism, mainly about progression, just like finding new ways, um, new paths. So that leads us to our next question. <laughs> what is one piece of, piece of advice that you would give to your past self? And does that advice still stand true? Yeah, I think you, I think you actually put it perfectly there. Perfection, not progression. Uh, I mean, yeah. not perfection, progression. Yeah. I think one thing I, I went to a mentor once and I think I talked to them because I did do that change between studying math and I took a bit of a different path and I left school for a year and I ended up in design and then I restarted school. And so I looked to a mentor and I said, I feel like I don't have it figured out. I feel like I'm supposed to have it figured out and I don't have it figured out and I don't know where I want to be in 10 years. Um, and I started freaking out and they were like, you're never going to no, you're always going to be figuring it out. Like you're never going to really know what you want to be when you grow up. That's a consistent and constant thing. And I think that's probably like in personal and professional, that's one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten is just, you don't have to ever have it figured out. You can always kind of think about, okay, I'm still evolving and I'm always changing. And if your dreams and your aspirations and what you want to do changes with that, that's completely normal and natural and amazing. Um, so yeah, don't be on yourself to kind of have a goal where you have to have it figured out, whatever age you have in your head, just, you know, do what makes you happy and keep following whatever you're interested in. Yeah, I feel like especially in high school, people need to know more about that because you always feel you're under the pressure that you need to know which university you're going to, what um, career path you need to take and like alter your university um, choices according to that career. But it's just a journey of like, just figuring things out along the way, I would say. I totally agree with that. So the last question, uh, question number eight, describe your current COVID status with an emoji. So you sent these questions in advance and I have to admit this is the hardest question by far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a list of things I could say. I debated between the ramen noodles or the ice cream because that's been what I've been eating for the most part. Um, and also just like the laptop or the woman on the laptop and just the laptop because I feel like I'm merging into my laptop. Like I'm not sure where we where we separate anymore. Um, so one of those or even like the woman shrugging because I feel like this is my current COVID question mark kind of thing. So for me, it's definitely the woman in the laptop on the boxes <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Yeah, the new normal. Yeah, I'm actually thinking like a course and yeah, yeah. Well, it's been awesome getting to know you and I've been really inspired oh. and hopefully our participants have been inspired, inspired as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much, Jeanette and Guadalupe. That was wonderful. Um, I really like what you said. And I like how you connected what Guadalupe was saying to um, Jeanette to your experience in high school. Because yeah, there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. of the decisions you have to make really young. Um, so I think that's really important for us to hear. I'm going to just ask one question and then we'll wrap it up. But um, and Jeanette, if you want to answer it as well after, it's what's one thing that has surprised you about the tech industry? And either of you could answer that. So Jeanette could be your own experience doing workshops in tech and then Guadalupe obviously working in tech. Yeah, okay, I can take that. One first. thing that surprised you. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think I had a really narrow idea of what tech was. And I think one of the biggest things is that for me, tech is the merger between creativity and um, science and maths and STEM fields. So I think that's the biggest surprise because I thought it was very analytical and I didn't see a lot of creativity in it when I first learned about tech. But being in tech, it's by far one of the most creative industries. You're always creating, you're always inventing, you're always exploring. Um, I feel like creativity is almost one of the most needed assets, um, no matter what you do in tech. So that would probably be my surprise element. Amazing. Thank you. That's so important for, for our students to hear and for me to hear even. I've, I've, <laughs> I'm not a coder by any means, but I've learned in the past two years over this job. And that was the biggest thing that surprised me. All the design aspects, that's always like the fun part for me. I do all the coding and I'm like, yeah, I get to add in the design elements. And there's so much creativity in that as well. Jeanette, did you want to answer that question? Up to you. I think you're on. Um, yep. I feel like the thing that totally surprised me about the tech industry would be um, how it's growing exponentially, but at the same time, we still have less 
women in tech. Like, it doesn't really make sense because it's growing, it's going to dominate the future, um, it's going to lead to a more prosperous future. However, we need more females. It's something that we need to raise more awareness about. And I feel like having this webinar does an amazing job of actually promoting the idea of having more women in tech. And I'm actually interested in actually having um, a career in tech in the future as well. But I'm still deciding on the path, though, which path to take specifically. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big field. Okay, thank you so much. Just in case you didn't hear, Danette, she was saying um, that it's very uh, surprising that, that even though tech is growing as an industry, that there is still a lack of females in it and, and, and that, that it's growing at such an exponential rate. So thank you so much, Jeanette. Uh, to close things off, I can't believe we're almost over. Lucy's just going to say a couple words and we're very conscious of the time. So I'll pass it over to you, Lucy, and I'll sign off myself. Thank you so much. It was so lovely to, to connect with you all virtually today. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, um, it was amazing hearing from you, Guadalupe and Jeanette, for sharing your experiences with us and especially sharing how technology has evolved in your role and how it applies to all industries, particularly the banking industry. So as Kamiko said, this leads us to the end of our webinar today. On behalf of the Hacker Gal Tech team, we want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing their inspiring stories um, and encouraging us to reflect on how coding has led to so many amazing personal transformations for them. Thank you to our amazing sponsors for supporting us throughout this journey and inspiring girls across Canada, um, CIBC, CSC, and Faskin's Law Firm. And to end things off, uh, we have one last poll. The poll, I'm just going to launch it right now. The poll is going to ask us, after this webinar, how do you feel about technology? So I'm going to give us about 20 seconds to answer. And if we have time, we can share the answer, the, the results. Amazing. I can see everyone's votes coming through. It was so inspiring to hear all of the stories and I hope um, we, I hope you took away the, the connection between creativity and code and how it applies to technology today. So it seems like most of us have submitted and I want to share the results. So a lot of us are very excited about using technology and, curious, uh, and are curious, curious about technology um, through this webinar. So amazing stuff. To end things off, I have a couple of reminders. Um, we have two more webinars coming up, um, coming up next Wednesday and the following Wednesday at the same time we'll be here. The next week's webinar is all about let's talk about distancing together. So what does it mean to meaningfully connect with one another through the throughout this uh, period of time? And then on June 3rd, we are we have our much anticipated Hacker Gal Day, which is a live event in celebration of gender diversity in tech. Um, and finally, we do have a post survey that will be prompted when you close the Zoom app. Um, I encourage you to fill this out. We love your feedback. We want to hear what you liked, what you didn't like, all of that good stuff. Um, and it's for a chance to win a Nintendo Wii Lite. So um, feel free to give that a go. And thank you so much, everyone, for participating. We had so much fun, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Thank you.